world news tonight. Closing curtains. The Paralympics get a spectacular send-off with grander hopes for Paris. New threats. A new variant is on the rise and possibly deadlier than the last. Rights riots. The Taliban to deal a heavy blow on any future of gender equality in Afghan. And it's showtime. Broadway comes back to life after months behind the curtain. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with the closing ceremony of Tokyo Paralympics that took place, bringing the curtains down on one of the eeriest games in Olympic history when events taking place in mostly empty stadiums due to the pandemic. Despite the odds being stacked against it, many watchers say Tokyo did a fine job hosting and the Paralympics flag is now passed on to Paris. Held against all odds under the unprecedented circumstances of a global pandemic, the Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games have finally come to an end. At the Paralympic closing ceremony on Sunday evening, organizers extinguished the cauldron after formally passing the baton to the next host city, Paris, in a nearly empty Japan National Stadium in the Japanese capital. A colorful ceremony of music, dance, fireworks, and another parade of nations marked the end of nearly two weeks of Paralympic competition. That saw China top the medal table with 96 gold medals and 207 medals overall. South Korea took home two golds, 10 silvers, and 12 bronze medals en route to finishing in 41st place. Congratulated as winners regardless of the medal tally by President Moon Jae-in on social media, the Korean delegation entered the parade 80th, led by Bocha Pairs champion Chung Ho Won as flag bearer. Among the 163 participant countries was Afghanistan, whose two athletes managed to miraculously represent their homeland by fleeing the Taliban through the help of the Australian government. In the words of International Paralympic Committee President Andrew Parsons, this year's Paralympians gave the world confidence, happiness, and hope, breaking records, winning hearts, opening minds, and changing lives. The ceremony celebrated youth with performances including breakdancing and BMX to roller skating and choir singing. But the highlight was the erection of the city where differences shine, a model city landscape of Tokyo where parading athletes affixed badge-like mirrors onto a replica sky tree lying on the ground before the tower was lifted to face Tokyo's night sky. Among those watching the ceremony in attendance was Japan's crown prince, Akishino. The world's greatest athletes now start the arduous journey of preparing for the Paris Games, scheduled to kick off on July 26, 2024. On to the COVID crisis, the vaccine minister has confirmed vaccine passport in indoor venues in England will be required at the end of the month. To get a more elaborate view on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Dilini Senviratna, who joins us now from London in the UK. Dilini? Yes, Shanali. Nadim Zahavi said it was the right time to start the scheme for sites with large crowds as all over 18s will have been offered two jabs by then. Asking people to show certificates with COVID vaccination proof has been criticised by venues and some MPs. Zahavi said that this would ensure the economy could remain open. He also indicated the government's plans to offer a COVID booster jab to most vulnerable people, including all over 50s, could get the go-ahead this month. And he said extending the vaccine rollout to all 12 to 15 year olds would absolutely be the right thing to do if the UK's chief medical officers recommended it. When asked about the vaccine passports, Mr. Zahavi referred to Premier League football clubs asking some fans to show proof they have been jabbed, which allowed stadiums to reopen to capacity crowds last month. Meanwhile, Bell says it has no plans to introduce COVID passports for venues, while ministers in Northern Ireland have not yet announced a position on a scheme. 
Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news pressure correspondent, Dilini Senmi Ratna, reporting from London in the UK. Over in the United States, healthcare workers are feeling the brunt of a fresh wave of the Delta variant as more infections rack up increasingly, causing front lines to deal with an emotional toll. This year, I've definitely put a lot more people in body bags than I would like to in my whole lifetime. A recent surge in COVID cases and deaths is once again straining the healthcare system in parts of the United States, and it's taking an emotional toll on frontline hospital workers. We're all tired. We all just try and take care of each other. In video provided by the Maine Medical Center, ICU nurses said they used to treat elderly patients or those with pre-existing conditions at the height of the pandemic, but now they're treating the unvaccinated in this most recent surge. We come to work every day, you good? and we know it's going to be a hard day. Every day is going to be a hard day. I am just anxious about what the day is going to bring, what's going to happen, who's going to die. These nurses in Portland, Maine, say the strain of dealing with so many critically ill or dying patients can sometimes be too much. Meanwhile, some other healthcare workers in the U.S. who treat COVID patients have reported struggling with something common to many military veterans, post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Half a dozen ICU staffers who experienced symptoms such as nightmares bathed in sweat, flashbacks to dying patients during the pandemic's fear-filled early days, flaring anger, and panic at the sound of medical alarms. Those whose symptoms last longer than one month and are severe enough to interfere with daily life can be diagnosed with PTSD. The surging Delta variant is heaping on fresh trauma as the United States and other nations begin to study PTSD in health workers. One hospital nurse told many of the emotions that first emerged during the worst of the pandemic are coming back, and another said there's no option but to just, quote, deal with it. New South Wales Premier Gladie Berry Jeeklian said daily infections were expected to peak in the state next week as they're looking to speed up immunizations ahead of easing restrictions. Now crossing over to other than a world news pressure correspondent Timothy Philip reporting now from Melbourne in Australia for more details. Timothy. Yes, Shana. Berry Jeeklian added that the government's modeling reviewed the state would require its highest number of intensive care beds in early October with additional pressure on the system in the next few weeks. A total of 1,071 COVID-19 cases are currently in hospitals, with 177 people in intensive care. Officials have said that they had quadrupled ICU beds to about 2,000 in the state early last year to handle the pandemic. On the other hand, nearly half a million doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine have arrived in Australia overnight. Officials have said the first batch of a swap deal with Britain that Australia is using to speed up its inoculation program as it battles a surge in cases that has put more than half its 25 million population in lockdown. People in Sydney and Melbourne, the country's two biggest cities as well as in the capital of Canberra, are under strict stay-at-home restrictions that the government has said will be gradually relaxed once between 70% of the people over the age of 16 have been vaccinated. Under the vaccine swap deals, Australia will return equivalent numbers of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccines to Britain and Singapore later this year. Back to you, Shana. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Timothy Philip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. While the Delta variant continues to sweep across the globe, multiple countries have reported the new COVID-19 mu variant. So far, health authorities have detected three cases of the mu variant in South Korea. South Korean health authorities are concerned about a new COVID-19 variant called mu. The authorities reported Friday that they have detected three cases of mu variant in Korea. All three cases were from overseas travelers from Mexico, the U.S. and Colombia who arrived in the nation since May this year. However, the authorities have not yet found any local transmissions. The Mu variant was first found in January, Colombia. Since then, more than 40 countries have reported the variant. Fully vaccinated people in England and Belgium have died from the Mu variant, and preliminary data show that the vaccines have reduced effectiveness against it. As a result, the World Health Organization has added the Mu variant to the list of variants of interest. 
In the U.S., the Washington Post reported Friday, the number of COVID patients with the mu variant now stands at over 2,000, mainly from California, Florida, Texas, and New York. Authorities confirmed 348 cases in the state of California alone. U.S. health officials, however, have said it's not yet a serious threat in the state, stressing the need to closely monitor whether it could spread faster than the Delta variant. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back over to the Afghan tensions. Taliban special forces in camouflage fired their weapons into the air, bringing an abrupt and frightening end to the latest protest march in the capital by Afghan women demanding, e demanding equal rights from the new rulers. They had taken to the streets for the second consecutive day, calling for the Taliban to respect women's rights. <laughs> until militants from the Islamist group swiftly broke up the protest. Despite the protest's abrupt end, the demonstrators stayed determined. The Taliban's assurances have done little to quell their fears. Millions of Afghan women still worry about their fate. It's not only the fate of women that hangs in the balance, but the future of the country also remains uncertain. This is the Taliban push forward to form a new government. Outside banks in Kabul, there are never-ending queues of Afghans desperate to take out their savings after the Taliban's advance through the country's economy into further disarray. Despite the dire economic situation, the Taliban still sees a bright future ahead for Afghanistan. Many Afghans remain skeptical about life under Taliban rule. The group's takeover has pushed up the price of basic commodities by as much as 20%. Guinean Special Forces staged a coup capturing President Alpha Conde and announcing a nationwide curfew until further notice, as well as the replacement of governors by the military. They've announced a curfew until further notice. Special Forces soldiers patrol the streets of the capital after claiming they've ousted Guinea's long-standing President Alpha Conde. This comes after hours of heavy gunfire near the presidential palace. An unverified video began circulating on social media on Sunday, showing Conde surrounded by soldiers who'd claimed they'd seize power and dissolve the government. Calling themselves the Committee for National Reunion and Development, they say the coup was a response to widespread corruption and poverty. When speaking on national TV later that evening, they insist the president is unharmed despite his unknown location. The military also announced the closure of Guinea's land and air borders and ordered the country's political elite to convene on Monday. In this opposition-strong neighbourhood, citizens took to the streets to celebrate. We are very, very happy with what we heard, what we saw. Guinea has been plagued by unrest for almost a year when Conde was re-elected for a controversial third term. This after he pushed through a new constitution that allowed him to sidestep the two-term limit, sparking mass protests. New Zealand had tried for years to deport the knife-wielding militant who wounded seven people at a mall in Auckland last week. The government said after it released more details on the attacker following the lifting of a court suppression order. New Zealand spent years trying to deport Mohammed Samsuddin, the attacker who stabbed seven people on Friday at an Auckland mall. That's according to Deputy Prime Minister Grant Robertson in a news briefing Sunday. At every opportunity, we have been looking for ways to deport this individual. Um, in the very first briefing that the Prime Minister is aware of getting in May 2018, she raised the issue of deportation. Court documents show the 32-year-old Tamil Muslim from Sri Lanka came to New Zealand on a student visa seeking refugee status, which was granted in 2013. Police became aware of Samsuddin in 2016 for advocating violent extremism online. He's been arrested twice for holding a knife and was released from jail earlier this year. During his three-year jail term, it was discovered his refugee status was obtained illegally. The government moved to cancel his visa, but the deportation was stopped because Samsuddin was in jail. We have to bear in mind we're talking here about a person who had refugee status. 
Um, and while you were aware that there's a process that went on about revoking that, uh, we still have to go through the processes. The government is not above the law, and we needed to go through that. Questions have been raised about an apparent gap in the country's counter-terrorism laws. And I'm sure if there are ways that we can improve it, we will. The New Zealand government said on Sunday they are continuing to review their immigration laws alongside laws to suppress terrorism. We have some good news for you. Separation surgeries for conjoined twins can be very complicated and Israel was able to achieve a life-saving milestone by successfully making two pairs of eyes meet. South Korean health authorities are concerned about a new COVID-19 variant called Mu. The authorities reported Friday that they have detected three cases of Mu variant in Korea. All three cases were from overseas travelers from Mexico, the U.S. and Colombia who arrived in the nation since May this year. However, the authorities have not yet found any local transmissions. The Mu variant was first found in January in Colombia. Since then, more than 40 countries have reported the variant. Fully vaccinated people in England and Belgium have died from the Mu variant, and preliminary data show that the vaccines have reduced effectiveness against it. As a result, the World Health Organization has added the Mu variant to the list of variants of interest. In the U.S., the Washington Post reported Friday, the number of COVID patients with the Mu variant now stands at over 2,000, mainly from California, Florida, Texas, and New York. Authorities confirmed 348 cases in the state of California alone. U.S. health officials, however, have said it's not yet a serious threat in the state, stressing the need to closely monitor whether it could spread faster than the Delta variant. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A World Cup qualifier between Argentina and Brazil was suspended amid farcical scenes after Brazilian health authorities accused a number of Premier League players of violating the country's COVID-19 quarantine rules. At least three Pakistan paramilitary soldiers were killed and 20 wounded in a suicide attack in the southwest part of a spike in attacks on security forces in recent weeks as neighboring Afghanistan fell to the Taliban. Vietnam's capital extended COVID-19 restrictions for a further two weeks as authorities launched a plan to test up to 1.5 million people for the coronavirus in high-risk areas of the capital to contain a climb in infections. Mexican security forces earlier blocked the passage of a new migrant caravan and detained several people as the government moved to break up the group a day after it set off from southern Mexico for the United States. The Taliban claim to have taken control of Panchi province north of Kabul, the last holdout of the anti-Taliban forces in the country. The resistance, however, said the valley had not yet fallen into the Taliban's hands and that its fighters continue the fight. Apple has been hit with an antitrust suit in India which accuses the company of abusing its dominant position in the smartphone apps business by essentially forcing app developers to pay a commission in all in-app transactions. Another challenge to Apple, this time in India. The tech giant is facing an antitrust challenge for allegedly abusing its position in the apps market by forcing developers to use its proprietary in-app purchase system. The allegations are similar to a case Apple faces in the European Union. Regulators there last year started an investigation into the firm's imposition of an in-app fee of 30%. The Apple case in India comes just as South Korea's parliament this week approved a bill dubbed the anti-Google law. It bans major app store operators like Alphabet's Google and Apple from forcing software developers to use their payment systems. The Indian case was filed by a non-profit group, which argues Apple's fee hurts competition. Details of cases filed with the Competition Commission of India, or CCI, are not made public. Apple and the CCI did not respond to a request for comment. In India, Apple's iOS powered just 2% of the 520 million smartphones there by the end of 2020. But experts say the US giant's customer base in the country has more than doubled in the last five years. Companies like Apple and Google say their fee covers the security and marketing benefits their app stores provide. In recent weeks, Apple has loosened some of the restrictions for developers globally. 
And finally tonight, Broadway's long-awaited reopening kicked off with the return of Tony-winning show Hades Town and the first musical to come back after an unprecedented 18-month shutdown. Hades Town, which won eight Tonys in 2019 for its modern rock twist on the ancient Greek tale of lovers, was the biggest show so far to take on the stage again ahead of the return of more than a dozen productions later in September. Joel Blackman, who played one of the three of the fates in Hades Town, said it felt overwhelming to be back at work. The performance was followed by a street party in the heart of the Manhattan Theatre District, led by the cast and the show's band. Audiences needed to be fully vaccinated and wear masks for the show, while actors and all backstage crew worked under strict protocols aimed at keeping the coronavirus at bay. Shows can play at 100% capacity. Broadway's three biggest musicals, Hamilton, The Lion King and Wicked, are reopening on September 14th, while others are rolling out through September and October. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.